From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Eve Holden, son. Hi, Sheriff. You put in a call for me, did you? Yes, I'm ready to go to work. Now that the inquest's been held and George Henderson's death is officially an accident, I might be able to move around your little town a little easier. What can I do for you? Help me to move around. Uh, case is closed, as far as I'm concerned. Eve, what's the matter with you? That inquest was a farce. For all I know, Henderson could have been pushed out of that hotel window. The attitude of different people in this town makes that whole oh, thing... Hold on now, son, hold on. I meant to say it's closed as far as my office is concerned. Personally, I think it needs investigating. We can help each other, maybe, you and me. Can I come over? Oh, I better come there. You know how folks are around here. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Culver, Montana, to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The question, accident, suicide, or murder? Expense account item four, $3.48, one day later to Tim Connors' office in Hartford explaining the situation in Culver. I'll, uh, I'll read it back to you, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Tim Connors, Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. Coroner's inquest into death of George Henderson, policy number EMP-19667, found death to be accidental. In my opinion, the inquest was not thorough. Have decided to stay on in Culver and conduct my own investigation. If any change, please advise via Western Union, Butte Hotel, Culver. Am forwarding copy of coroner's verdict this date. Best regards, Dollar. Correct? Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, sure. Expense account item five, 68 cents, postage. I mailed a copy of the coroner's verdict to Hartford Airmail Special. After that, I went back to my hotel to wait for the sheriff, Eve Holton. Come on in, Eve. I... Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Dollar, my name's Porter. I'm the manager of this hotel. Oh, well, come in, Mr. Porter. I, I can't right now. I've got some other things to attend to. Well, anything I can do for you, Mr. Porter? I I'm going to have to ask you for your room, Mr. Dollar. Oh, When? Uh, t today. Any particular reason? We're all filled up. Uh, the, the room's been reserved for six weeks. By whom? What? Who reserved it? Why, uh, a man from Bozeman. It, it's a sort of convention. Sort of convention. What kind of convention is that, Mr. Porter? Look, Mr. Dollar, you'll have to leave this room today. The man's coming in tonight. Aha. Uh -huh. And there's no other hotel in town. That's the way it is, Mr. Dollar. No other place to stay? No. So I have to pack my bags and get out of town, is that it? I must have the room, Mr. Dollar. Who asked you to say you wanted the room, Mr. Porter? Who asked you to come here and kick me out? Why, no one, I... Well, I, you I... go back to no one, Mr. Porter, and you tell no one that I'm staying right here in this room here in Culver until I finish what I have to do here. You tell that to no one, will you? Mr. Dollar, I'd, I'd hate to call the police. Go ahead, Mr. Porter. Be sure and tell them about the sort of convention you're having and how all the rooms are sold out. Tell them about Mr. No One and tell them I called your bluff. Anything else, Mr. Porter? I was at the stage where I was beginning to take notes for myself. Note one, the mayor didn't want to have an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Note two, when they did have an inquest, they didn't want to really find out anything. Note three, Mr. Hotel Manager wanted me to keep on not finding out anything by getting me out of town. I explained all of this to Eve Holton when he showed up a half an hour later. Well, kind of, kind of tight, isn't it? I don't know what that means, Sheriff, but it's pretty stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's stupid, son, but it could be effective. Now, I'll tell you what. If Porter calls the police, I'm the police, so don't worry about that. I'll hem him and haw him. All right, thanks. 
Now then, uh, tell me how much your insurance company stuck for. $50,000 if Henderson's death goes by as an accident. The good book says that's what it was. I know, I know. There's a chance, too, we had a heart failure and fell out of that window. No, sure. Always a chance. We might have to dig him up and find out, Sheriff. Oop, uh, hold on. Autopsies and digging people up is one thing you'd have a hard time doing around here. I might insist on it. I don't know. Well, let that go for now. Say, tell me about Mrs. Henderson. Where's she from? Here. Right here in Culver. Now, she didn't get that mink coat and those diamonds she was wearing at the inquest in Culver. More important, she didn't get that continental look here either. So what's the story? Well, her name was Pauline Underwood before she married George. Born and raised right here in Culver. Of course, she went to school in the East, and she's been in Europe a couple of times, but most of her life's been right here. She is a mighty pretty widow. And a mighty rich one, too. Henderson had it. I know. This divorce she talked about at the inquest yesterday. Well, everybody in town knew they weren't getting along, never did get along. How could they? Pauline's 26 and George is 59. He could have been her father. As a matter of fact, he almost was. Well, tell me about that. You got a drink? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, George raised Pauline from the time she was 14. He paid for all her schooling and growing up. She didn't have any folks after her old man died. George was pretty good to her. He sure was. <laughs> was he a friend of her parents? Well, Tom Underwood worked out at the ranch for George. When he died, there was Pauline standing there. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. And she eventually married him and his money, huh? Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way exactly. I, I think she liked him. Now, I, I've gone over what you're thinking, son. Those two were talking about divorce for some time. The papers had been drawn up for a settlement. She'd have got a lot of alimony and so on. Oh, Pauline had no call to push him out that window or have him pushed out. At least not for money. All right. Suppose he didn't want a divorce. Suppose he loved her and she came to the hotel room that morning and he pleaded with her to try all over again. Suppose she said no. Suppose she said no in a great big cold way. And George Henderson sat there and thought about it after she left. And he got sick all over and he walked over to that window and... Suicide? What do you think? You know him. Uh, he wasn't a suicide type. So... Oh, nobody's the suicide type until they come to the end of the line, Eve. Then it's too late to interview them and ask them how they got there. Everybody seems to think it was an accident, so I'm just throwing words around. You have a right to do that if you aren't satisfied, son. Hey, getting back to this hotel again. Who might want me to get out of town and not ask any questions? Anybody. Well, who? No idea. But it's somebody who has some feelings in this. Hey, who owns this hotel, Eve? Noah Baxter. Who's Noah Baxter? Rancher. Got a place about 15 miles from here. Pretty big man. Uh huh. Friend of Henderson's? Yeah. Hmm. And let me put that question a little different. Baxter, a friend of Mrs. Henderson's. I don't know. Can you find out? I can try. Well, find out about him and any other friends, Eve. Friends that might be younger, that might have gone to Europe or school in the East. Yeah, sure. What are you thinking now, son? Well, now, if I were Mrs. Henderson and my husband fell out of a window in this hotel and killed himself, I'd hire a lawyer and I'd sue the hotel for damages. If the insurance company didn't pay off my claim, I'd hire a lawyer and insist that they pay that claim. I'd do those things right away, Sheriff, especially if I thought it was all legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. Two hours later, I received a wire from Tim Connors. He requested me to look up a man named Thurber, an insurance broker living in Great Falls. Expense account item six, $4.92, tank of gas. I borrowed Sheriff Holton's car and drove the 80-odd miles to Great Falls that afternoon. Mr. Thurber bought lunch. My Lord, I hope there isn't anything to all this, Mr. Dollar. I just hope there isn't. George Henderson. My. Yeah, well, there isn't anything to anything yet, Mr. Thurber. I'm still trying to find out the facts. Oh, I knew you were over in Culver. I tried to call you there a couple of times. You were out both times. Finally, I put in a call to the home office in Hartford. I talked to this man, Connors, with the adjustment agency. Yeah. You see, Mr. Dollar, it's like this. I've been over in Jackson Hole for five days now hunting duck. We were way in, and I didn't hear about Henderson's death until I got back yesterday. Uh-huh. Now, uh, look, Mr. Dollar, I don't know what reflection this will have on your attitude toward this case, but two days before I left, Mr. Henderson telephoned me here in Great Falls. He said he wanted to change the beneficiary on his policy. Oh, in other words, he was going to cut his wife out? Huh? Yes, I suppose so. 
I know they weren't getting along. There'd been talk of divorce. Yes, I guess so. Uh Uh-huh. Did he name a new beneficiary? Yes, a schoolteacher in Culver named Matilda Knickerbocker. Everybody calls her Maddie. What was his connection with her? None that I know of. I think it was just a name for him to throw in until he could decide on another beneficiary why he didn't have... Wait a minute. Maddie Knickerbocker. Just a schoolteacher. Everybody knows her. He was awful mad when he talked to me that day. I could tell it in his voice. Now, here's what might interest you just a little more. The day I left in my hunting trip, Mr. Henderson phoned me again. He said to never mind. Mrs. Henderson was still his beneficiary. Had you changed the policies yet? No. Are you sure it was Henderson who telephoned you? Well, yes, of... I I think it was him. Do you remember when you got the call? Somewhere around noon, a little later, I guess. He died between 12.30 and 1. And it must have been just before he fell out the window. He phoned you long distance from cover, huh? Yes, sir. Well, he was supposed to have been in the hotel all morning, so he had to phone from his room. Well, you can check that, can't you? (laughs) You'd be surprised how hard it is to check simple things like that around the Butte Hotel. Did you know Henderson very well, Mr. Thurber? He was a customer. I wrote a lot of insurance for him. Know his wife? Oh, yes. Well, tell me about them. Go ahead, Mr. Thurber. Uh, Now, look, accidents rarely have reason behind them. Suicides and murders always do. You don't think it was an accident? Well, let's say I've heard enough and seen enough to make it a draw so far. Go ahead, tell me about him. And I wish I was married to Mrs. Henderson. I mean, I wish she could see me. I think most any man who's ever met her hoped the same thing. Young men, old men, any kind. But she picked George. George was as tough and leathery as these mountains around us, exactly her opposite. But Pauline married him. He raised her. He was close to her all her adult life. Yes. But Mr. Dollar, you know and I know she didn't have to marry him. She could have married anybody here in Culver or anybody in London or Paris. You see what I mean? And not quite. Well, I always had the idea that after she married him, she kept letting him know she could have had anybody else she wanted. Go ahead, Thurber. I think she married him for his money. I think she would have killed him for his money. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the whole affair becomes a town issue, and I become the town goat. Incidentally, let me take a moment to say thanks for the many kind letters you've sent. We appreciate them more than you know. And I only wish it were possible to answer them all personally. Again, thank you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.